ちょいちょい。Good morning, Cross Point. If you will, let's stand and worship the Lord this morning.
thankful for his power this morning. And no matter what comes our way, there's nothing that he can't do for us.
a new song this morning, and the title of the song is called Jireh. And the first place we, we find out in Jireh is in the story of Moses, uh, Abraham and Isaac. When, God, when Abraham declared that God, the Lord my provider, that God is my provider. And the chorus says, Jireh, you are enough. Jireh, you are enough. And I will be content in every circumstance. Jireh, you are enough. And no matter what we're going through today, no matter what we're facing, we have the hope and we know that God is enough. It doesn't matter if we've been hurt. It doesn't matter if we've been accused of things. It doesn't matter if, we have, if, if we've been broken, if we've fallen. God is enough. And the most important thing that He is enough is in salvation through His Son, Jesus Christ. That even if He doesn't move the mountain that you're facing right now, He is enough. And even if He doesn't take care of the problem that you may be facing, guess what? He's still enough. He's still enough because He provided a way. He was enough. Jesus was enough for my sins. And through His blood and through His sacrifice and through His death, I have escaped death. Not because of who I am and not because of what I've done and not because of what I do, but because of who He is and what He has done. So if you're standing here today, I know this song is new and you may not have heard it. But if you've got something in your life right now that you say, God, I don't know if I can stand this. I don't know if I can bear this. I want you to remember it. I want you to be reminded that God is enough. And if he doesn't move it, he's still enough. So won't you praise this morning and won't you cry out to him that, Jireh, you are enough. nothing I can do to let you down. It doesn't take a trophy to make you proud. I'll never be more loved than I am right now. Going through a storm, but I won't go
thank you for another day that we can come to your house, Lord, to worship you. Lord, I want to thank you for everything you do for us day in and day out, Lord. Thank you for being our healer when we need a healing, Lord. Thank you for being the peacemaker when we need peace in our life, Lord. Lord, I pray today that if there's somebody here that has a burden, Lord, or they don't know you, that before the service comes to an end, Lord, that they'll come down to this old-fashioned altar and they'll give their life to you, they'll give their problems to you, Lord. I want to pray that you'll be with pastors that brings the message that you gave to them this morning, Lord, and just keep us safe throughout this upcoming week and continue to be with our country, Lord, that you're the only one that can fix it. In your heavenly name we pray, amen. Thank you, singers and band members. Take your Bibles and turn to Philippians chapter number 3. Philippians chapter number 3. And I'm going to read verse number 13. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. USA Today article not that long ago said that the average person makes 35,000 decisions a day. A lot of decisions. <laughs> 35,000. Every day that we live, we make a decision. Now, some of them are, you know, we need to do without thinking, but we make them. A Bohemian preacher by the name of Miles Monroe put it this way, Our life is the sum total of the decisions we make every day. And, and those decisions are determined by our priorities. You make a decision based upon priorities. Seems like a lot of decisions. Some we make with delight. Some are very difficult. Some are insignificant, yet some seem impossible. Some are helpful. Some are hurtful. Some are common, while others are very critical. We make these decisions sometimes without thinking. You ever heard the phrase, what was he thinking? And somebody respond, he wasn't thinking at all. <laughs> we make these decisions. But if we are to satisfy that holy discontent in our heart, which we should have, every person here should have that holy discontent in your heart to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord and to never get satisfied with where you're at in your spiritual journey. You can't sit and say, I'm happy, okay, I'm not going to learn anymore, do anymore, that's just not going to be a, a happy life. If we are to satisfy that holy discontent, we're going to have to make some very hard decisions. No decision is really a decision in itself. So we have to make some hard 
decisions. And that's what I want to talk about this morning, is making hard decisions. Some are very, very hard to make. Some are impossible to make. Brenda and I were had a decision to make whether we were going to go to Pennsylvania. For a southern boy, that was a daunting decision. My first question was, will they have Crowder peas up there? And will they, uh, do they know about okra and turnip greens and cornbread? And hard decision. When we arrived uh, with all of our furniture and they were going to unload our furniture in uh, what was the prophet's quarter there in the church, uh, they wanted to fix us some lunch. And they fixed us meatball sandwiches. Now to me, a little southern boy, meatballs go in spaghetti. They don't go in sandwiches. I didn't know how to eat it. They had a big hot dog bun, poured it open, put the, ha the stuff in there. And what are you supposed to do, pick it up or eat it? with? I didn't know what to do with it. And then I discovered what Scrabble was. Anybody here know what Scrabble is? What is it? Scrapple, yeah. Anybody know what that is? If you know what that is, say amen. Oh, it's awful. I can't even describe it. But I had to make a decision whether I was going to eat it or not. In the overall scope of things, it wasn't earth shattering. But if I don't eat this stuff, that that put members of my church is providing for me. That'll be the first uh, chance they have to criticize me. He didn't even eat what we brought him. Hard decisions. <laughs> well, Paul is talking here about. I have not apprehended. I have not reached my goal yet. I have not completed my journey yet. And if I am to complete my journey, there's a couple of things I'm going to have to do. They're very hard decisions to make. Now, you can make them for two reasons. Number one, because there's something called the Scriptures. And we can always find comfort and guidance when we read the Bible to help us deal with hard decisions. Then we've got the Spirit of God that lives within us. Um, if you'll let the Spirit of God control your life and speak to you concerning things about His Word, He'll give you clear leading, and the decisions that we make, whether hard or not very hard, will become a lot easier. So I want to talk about two things that Paul uh, had to decide to do that were very, very difficult to do. They're difficult for us today. Um, it doesn't get any easier. Um, but you're going to have to make these two decisions if you progress in your spiritual life. If you uh, keep moving forward and growing and becoming more useful. And by the way, that's what we're all supposed to be doing is working to become more useful in his hands. You can't put a 14-year-old or a 13-year-old or a 2-year-old behind the wheel of a car. They have to learn. They have to grow. They have to mature. Well, you can't put someone that is immature in a place where he can do damage to other people if he doesn't know what the Bible has to say. I remember a Sunday school class in a church that I was pastoring, hadn't been there very long, but my son went to the class, and uh, he come back and he said, Dad, I don't want to go to that class anymore. And I said, why? And he said, the teacher said that the way you get things from God is to murmur. So the children of Israel murmured against God, and that's what you got to do to get things from God, is to murmur. 
Well, I don't think that's the way God answers prayer and all God's people said. I don't think that's... Uh, uh, so you can't be immature in places of maturity. Two things, and then I'll be done. Look, if you would, please, in verse number 13, the first part of the verse. He said, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting, and here it is, forgetting those things which are behind. Now, the word forgetting means to neglect. It means to ignore. Uh, it means to not think about and do it by choice. You know, some things pop in our mind and we just play with it for a little while when we should expel it, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Uh, but the past is something that you're going to have to forget, forgetting those things which are behind. Um, we can linger in the past to learn, but I'm telling you, living in the past means that you're going to lose. But uh, forgetting the past. Well, Paul had a lot to forget. And he had this ability to do it because the Spirit of God lived within him. Let me give you three things that he had to forget. Number one, he had to forget the betrayal of a friend. He had to forget the fact that he had been betrayed by a close confidant. In 2 Timothy chapter number 4 and verse number 10, you'll find these words. For Demas hath forsaken me. Have you ever been betrayed by a friend? Have you ever been uh, betrayed by someone that you trusted? Someone that you thought highly of and you held in high esteem? And they betrayed you and that brought a great deal of emotional pain to your life. We talked about this Wednesday night. The psalmist said he was, uh, the proud had him in great derision, or they were mocking him and betraying him and making fun of him. It's very painful. It keeps you from growing on because that dwells in your heart and your mind all the time, being betrayed by a friend. Um, the pain of betrayal is much more intense than the pain that comes when someone physically uh, hurts you because it lasts, it lingers. The devil keeps bringing it up. The devil will constantly tell you that uh, how many people, if you heard this phrase, if you've ever heard this phrase, I want you to say amen real loud. He was hurt in church. You ever heard people say that? Ever? <laughs> Same thing. If you've been hurt in church, say amen. So it's as common as air. It happens to all of us. It happens to the best of us. And uh, it's painful. And, and the devil will keep using it to keep us from being everything that God wants us to be. Now, let me show you something about Demas, and I want you to see this, because it's very, very important. Demas had every opportunity to be a blessing to Paul the Apostle, and in his dying hour, just hours perhaps before he was executed, Paul said, Demas has forsaken me. Sounds to me like he was looking for Demas to help him, to minister to him, uh, to be his confidant, but he said, here, Demas hath forsaken me. Now, here's what I want you to see, and here's what I want you to remember. Demas had every opportunity, more so than anybody else, to learn and grow and develop his spiritual life, if he was saved, than most people in the Bible. In uh, Philippians and Philemon, Paul mentions the fact in, uh, uh, excuse me, Colossians, in Colossians 4.14, he says, that Demas and the beloved Paul greet you, or the beloved Luke greet you. In other words, he put Demas on the same level as he did with, the, with Luke the physician, his beloved physician. 
Now, Luke was a Gentile, and he wrote two books of the Bible uh, and uh, probably wrote more words than Paul did in the Bible, and he was a close confidant, and Demas was right there with Luke and Paul when they were going through difficult times. In Philemon chapter, Philemon verse 24, he mentions a couple of other guys. Aristarchus uh, was a friend, and Marcus, and Luke. And he saw all those great men of God and worked with them, but somehow or another, he, uh, he didn't stay true. Aristarchus was such a faithful friend of Paul that he was with him in Ephesus when they were uh, when the big riot took place. He also was with Paul uh, when Paul was on his way to Rome on a, a prison ship, and he was there. Luke was with him most of the time. Marcus was a young man who failed Paul in the beginning, and uh, but now that he has learned and trained and become mature, Paul says in Philippians uh, uh, 2 Timothy 4, I want to see him. He had taken the discipline that was given to him by Paul the Apostle by not letting him go on the second missionary trip, and he hooked up with Barnabas, and then he met Peter, and he would later write the book of Mark based upon the information he got from Peter. So he had every opportunity. He had all kinds of opportunities uh, to be a blessing to the kingdom. They did great things together. But he betrayed him. And Paul had to remember that. And if he did, it would destroy his life. He had to forget it. Forgetting the fact that somewhere down the line, we don't know when it happened, but somewhere down the line, Demas forsook him. So I want to tell you this. As you go through your Christian life, if you hadn't already found this out, Somebody is going to step on your sensitivities and they're going to hurt you deeply. And you better not remember that. You better forget it. How can I forget it? You can forget it the same way that you remember to read the Word of God and all God's people said. That's the reason. That's how you forget to be engaged in the Word of God. Forgetting those things, the betrayal of a friend. Second thing he had to forget was the beating by his foes. Second Corinthians chapter 11, verse 24 and 25. He says, I was beaten five times by the Jews. Three times I was beaten with rods. Now rods is the, is the uh, uh, weapon of choice for uh, the Romans. And they, they're, they're kind of a big st stick-like. And he was beaten three times there. And he said, finally, I was stoned, left for dead, outside of Lystra. So he had to forget all those scars that he carried from being beaten. He had to forget all those uh, times that uh, his enemy, uh, I was thinking the other day, I, I just really thought about this, and you'll forgive me for my honesty, but uh, being so blatant, but there's times, have you ever thought that you've lost the battle? Say amen. Have you ever just looked around and said, man, we're losing the battle? We're losing the battle. The, the, uh, the devil is winning with all the things that's going on in society, the violence and, and uh, all the things that are happening. And it's right in your face, and you, uh, you just feel beat up by the world. You just feel like, I, I can't stand this, like that song, He is Enough. When, when you feel like you've been beaten down by the world, He is always enough. And you just have to forget what the world has done for you and done to you. How easy it would have been for Paul to be bitter. His friend had forsaken him and he'd been beaten by his foes. Uh, but he would be the one that would write in chapter 4 of Ephesians, verse 31, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor be put away from you with all malice. He was conscious that it was possible to be bitter. And he had to forget that. Just had to forget what people had done to him. I've never been beaten by anybody physically. I come close. Real close. 
I've had someone's fist balled up and ready to swing. And uh, I've never been physically attacked. But spiritually, I'm attacked every day. If you're not attacked, you're not making much headway in the kingdom. If you don't have the spiritual battle going on all the time, you're not upsetting Satan very much. So uh, he was beaten by his foes, and he had to forget about all that. Um, thirdly, he had barriers that he had to cross to finish his test, his journey. Um, he said in Acts chapter 20, verses 23 through 24, I won't read it, but he was headed for Jerusalem, and uh, he met with the Ephesian elders, and they were begging him not to go because they knew it would be trouble in Jer Jerusalem. And he actually said, the Holy Ghost tells me there's going to be trouble uh, in Jerusalem, but he says, none of these things move me that I might finish my course. The Satan of this world is going to put everything in front of you, every barrier he can to keep you from finishing your course. Now remember, Psalms 37, verse 23, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his ways. Remember this, God has a plan for your life. He has it laid out, and he wants you to follow it, and he'll walk with you, but I promise you, there will be barriers that prohibit and prevent and fight against you from finishing your course, and you need to absolutely forget about what the devil is doing and keep reminding yourself of what God can do. Because there's always going to be a stumbling block. Always going to be a stumbling block. I don't know how many times that uh, I've had to go through barriers to finish my course. And each barrier leaves on your spiritual so a scar and a hurt, but you have to keep on going, and you have to forget it. You just have to forget it and not keep thinking about it all the time. So he had to forget some things. That's the first problem, learning to forget. Secondly, look, if you would, please, in the latter part of verse 13. And reaching forth to those things which are before. Reaching means to strive, to stretch. I remember uh, years ago in Gainesville, we had a Christian school and we had a, uh, had a track team. Had a boy by the name of Tim Brockway, uh, who was a good kid. His mom and daddy were missionaries. And, and he was living with us while his mom and daddy, he, while he finished high school, while his mom and daddy was in Mexico. He wanted to finish here, and so he lived with us. And, and I remember he was in a uh, 220 race, uh, 220 yards in those days. And I can remember him coming around the curb, and he won it, by the way, coming around the one turn that you have to make in a 220. And I can see the veins on his neck stretching and striving and working as hard as he could, as hard as he could to get to the goal line. A lot of things could have hindered him. A lot of things could have hindered him. A lot of things could have gotten in his way, but he forgot them all and kept reaching for the goal. Now, what was Paul reaching for? Well, let me give you three things and we'll be done. Number one, Paul was wanting to finish his course because it was God's purpose. You remember in Acts chapter 9, verses 15 and 16, he was given his call he was called and told he was a chosen vessel. This is what Ananias told him. You're a chosen vessel, and you shall preach before Gentiles and, and Jews and kings. So he had a purpose in his life. His purpose was to preach before Gentiles and Jews and kings. And he was not going to be deterred uh, from God's purpose in his life. And he would say, it's not from man. I didn't get it from man. I didn't receive it from man. I didn't study to get it. God gave me the call, and that's my purpose in life. His purpose in life 
was to preach the gospel to Jews and Gentiles and to kings. And by the way, he did every one of those things. It cost him, but he did it. His purpose was to preach the gospel. Secondly, God's plan. In Romans chapter 15, verse 23, he's writing to the Roman church and he says, he's actually saying, I'm going to come by Rome on my way to Spain. And I, we don't think he ever got to Spain. But he was planning on going to Spain. Now listen to me carefully. I want you to listen to this. Don't, don't miss this. Reaching for those things that are before. God has a plan for every life in this room. And then he has a plan collectively for the church as a whole. And our job is to find what his plan is for our life and then find what God's plan is for the church and reach out there for it. Not sit by and say, well, we're going to wait until God... No, 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 no. You make plans to do whatever God leads you to do, and then if He wants to change the plan, then He has the right to do that. In other words, Paul, on his first, second missionary journey, said, I'm going back to the places that I went on my first journey, and God put a halt to that and sent him the Macedonian call and said, I don't want you to go east, I want you to go west. And so he answered God's plan. He did what God said to do, but he had a plan. He had a plan. I had a plan to preach the gospel till the day I die. But uh, those plans sometimes uh, were in Georgia, and sometimes it was in Pennsylvania. And, uh, but I had to adjust my plans and do what God wanted me to do, still keeping focus on what he had called me to do. So you've got to keep planning. You've got to keep planning. And plan to read through the Bible. Plan to witness to other people. Plan to lead your family in the ways of righteousness. Plan to give. Plan to do what God wants you to do. I, Brent and I plan every January what we're going to give to the church, and we do that. We just keep giving it. If God says give more, we give more, but we've got a plan. We know where we're going. We know what we're doing. So we had to reach for God's plan. Finally, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 28, he reached for God's purpose, he's reaching for God's plan, and he's reaching for God's people. You remember this text where he said, uh, I got all these things, but what daily cometh upon me? the care of the churches. Would you listen to me very carefully for the next few minutes and I'll be done. Are you listening? If you are, say amen. One of the most damaging, and you're going to be shocked by this, one of the most damaging things that can happen to a church is if that church is based on relationships. Now what do you mean by that? I mean, churches are not supposed to be gatherings of people of like hobbies and like thinking and like, uh, we're supposed to be a gathering of people whose relationship with the Lord Jesus is what brings us together. You understand that? Our relationship with Him will make our relationship with others so much better. Say amen. But when you get your eyes off of Him, and you get your eyes on somebody else, that's when trouble shows up. We've got to keep our eyes on him. And Paul said, listen, the care of the churches, God's people, it ought to be, it ought to be that God's people Love God's people because God first loved us. I can't be 
eternally angry with somebody because God's not eternally angry with me. We love Him because He what? First loved us. So we've got to keep our eyes on what's important. We're a church. We've got all kinds of people here. We've got a lot of people with warts and problems and difficulties and um, people to see differently. My office every Sunday morning we see a lot of people see differently. Security team comes to my office to have prayer and we have a die-hard Tennessee fan and a die-hard Georgia fan. They ought to love each other, not because of Georgia, Tennessee. They love each other because of Jesus. You should never have a problem with another member in the church if you love Jesus. Well, he hurt my feelings. Well, yeah, I'll get him. Yeah, I guess he did. Walmart hurt your feelings too, but you still go back there. Well, they said the wrong thing. Well, if you pull through the drive-in somewhere and they said the wrong thing, and but you'll go back there again. I went to all places, the place where they always get the, the order right. Drove through the other day and picked it up, got home, and to my amazement, it wasn't right. They had left out something out of my order. I am never going back. I'm going to stand out in front of their establishment and tell everybody they left out an order out of my, they didn't put my french fries in. I'm going to carry a banner against them the rest of my life. That's, that's so stupid. It's just, just stupid. And it's stupid when believers have conflict with other believers and they can't resolve it, but they spend their life in bitterness. I'm going to tell you something. Ain't, God ain't nowhere around you if you're bitter about what somebody else did to or through or about you. Can't be bitter, man. But they hurt me. Sure they did. Sure they did. Just remember Jesus got hurt too. He got hurt physically. He got hurt emotionally. Now listen. He got hurt spiritually when he hung on the cross and said, My God, my God, why hast thou, what's the word? So he hurt in ways that you've never experienced. So here's the hard decisions we've got to make. First of all, we've got to make the decision to forget the things that are behind. And then we've got to make the decision to reach forward to those things and let God lead us individually as well as collectively. And when we do that, we'll be able to enjoy Paul's... You realize he wrote the book of Philippians and it's all about joy and he was in jail when he wrote it. Nineteen times he talked about happiness and joy and he was in prison while he wrote. You can be happy wherever you're at. It's a choice you make. You decide to forget what's happened and reach to what is going to happen. Father, we love you. We thank you for loving us. I pray that you'll help us to be sensitive to your Holy Spirit and that we would indeed forget those hurts and harms and the things that are behind us and reach to those things that are before us realizing we've got a great responsibility to carry your word. And I pray that you'll bless us together. Thank you for loving us. And help us to be sensitive to everything that you ask us to do. We'll praise you in Jesus' name. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Would you stand to your feet, please? Just stand right up where you're at. She's going to sing. If you have a need, the altar's here. If you need to come pray, you come pray. If you need to 
receive Christ, let us know. We'll be more than happy to show you how to become a believer. Sing, Allie, when you will, please. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Thank you, Allie. You may be seated. A Wednesday night is our Bible study. Make sure that you're here. Uh, it was our second one after we come back from Christmas, and I know some of you missed, and I want to encourage you to please be here for that on Wednesday night. Chad, are you in here? Chad wanted to make an announcement. Anybody know what that announcement was? Well... I think he wants to have something on the 29th for the kids' point. And he also needs somebody th uh, this Saturday to come and help work and clean up the back and get it all ready uh, after the uh, walk through Bethlehem. Is he, is he coming? Does anybody know? Yeah, see how fast he can run. You call him? He answer his phone? Any other announcements I need to make? Well, we'll just sit here and enjoy each other's company. Come on in. Didn't mean to disturb you. I just, I'm, I'm fine. <laughs> I'm waiting on you. time we had one. Yeah. Thank you, Chad. I hope when I get to heaven, the Lord will explain to me the blessings of camping. Why do you spend thousands upon thousands upon thousands of dollars for a house and a nice bed and then go sleep in the woods? I just don't get that. <laughs> I don't get that. I just don't get it. Oh, yeah, well, 
Uh, I'm not sleeping in no hammock. I can't. If you got a bed as good as mine at home, I may take you up on that. Uh, let me just mention this, and I, I, I really am serious about this. We really need for you to make sure that you make your tithes, make your offering. Uh, you can do it by text to tithe. You can do it through the website, or you can drop it in the box in the back. We we don't say a lot about it, but we desperately, this is a tough time of the year because of Christmas and all the other things that we had to do. It's been a lot of money. And uh, so we got this sign, I think, out down on the highway that got uh, blown away by the or damaged by the wind. We have the fence in the back that's been damaged by the wind. And uh, so we, we got some expenses coming. And so if you could uh, just give a little extra, I know the Lord will bless you for that. All right, let's stand to our feet. We'll be dismissed. Your giving records are at the uh, visitors. I don't know what it's called anymore. Guest services, yeah. And um, also...